John Gerzema is the chief insights officer at Young and Rubicam, which means that in his day job, he manages a database of perceptions of brands, which uh, Young and Rubicam calls the brand asset evaluator. It's an in-depth survey of what consumers think about brands. It's been going back, what, two decades now? Or? and how they're regarded and, and what, I, in other words, you know, if you're IBM or McDonald's or Apple or Frito-Lay, you know, he knows if you've been naughty or nice. He knows if you've been loved, hated, respected or mistrusted and um, he knows the perception of what people think of you and how that's grounded in reality. Um, he and his uh, partner, Ed Labar. And then in, in his spare moments, he thinks about what that means. Uh, his past book, The Brand Bubble, which came out two years ago, 2008, was a look at the rising, well, the, the increasing difficulty that brands have in uh, being respected and trusted. And um, just at the point that that hit the bookshelves, this uh, odd series of events, which we now call the global economic crisis, happened. And set in stone, you know, sort of paved the way for John's current book, which is called Spend Shift with Michael D'Antonio. And I guess to sum up the book in a phrase, it's kind of, you know, the economic meltdown didn't kill us, so we must be stronger, right? It's kind of <laughs> something like that. Pretty much, Michael. I, um, first of all, thanks, thanks for having me here. This is just an absolutely beautiful venue. Um, we set out to understand how the crisis had affected people's lives and the kind of overarching uh, message in the book is a message of optimism that perhaps the, the crisis was actually a, a good thing long term down the road. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way to the, to the challenges that we face today uh, as a society and the persistent unemployment. But as I traveled the country, both first with the data in hand and then literally traveling around the country, uh, spending time in dozens of communities in both red states and blue states, I found incredible resiliency uh, in the American people and a tremendous amount of entrepreneurialism and innovation that was flourishing despite all the hardship. I mean, the title says spend shift. What's the core shift? What? One of the things that we found over the course of the last 10 years is that there's been this remarkable lack of trust in the institutions. And what's happening is that people are realizing that even though they're less rich, they're actually more powerful. And there's a series of forces that are in play. One is the fact that we can use our wallets now almost like the voting booth as a form of expression. We have the ability now accentuated by social media and all these networks that we cover uh, with a lot of the companies in the books that, that people now have the ability to actually force businesses to be about better instead of more. And that's really what the spend shift's about. It's 55% of all Americans. Um, what was interesting about it is that they're actually voting with their values. And I know when we use the word values, that sounds like, okay, here we go. It's very a politicized discussion. But these values were actually common Main Street values. People were looking for companies that had trust and empathy. They were looking for businesses that would connect with authenticity and quality. They were looking for businesses that would be more self-reliant. In fact, in our data, 56% of Americans said they would not support a company who took government bailout money. So it's that sort of thing that's emerging, is that people are realizing they actually have power, and they have this ability to, to force the businesses to be more accountable to what they're looking for. And this was already starting before the meltdown, but the meltdown accentuated it. Yeah, yeah it was. I mean, it was interesting when we went back and looked at the data, People began saving more as early as 2006, but also in the data, we found that people were adjusting their lives before the crisis hit. We did an analysis of what people's needs were versus their wants, and we, they were becoming more in line. So we were starting to ask ourselves on some level, do we really need that third plasma TV in our house, or do we need that, that second car? Um, and we'll, we can talk a little bit about it, but some of the brands and the companies that are making big statements today are actually helping people live a more nimble, more thrifty life. You also have examples of people who they're not finding the companies out there that reinforce these values, so they're kind of doing things differently. They're starting their own or living differently. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we travel the country, Art, and one of the places we went to um, was Detroit. And if, if I could um, 
flip over and show a couple of photos real quick. I'll just tell a couple stories. But if you, if you go into Detroit, right, this is a place where the um, average price of a house in inner city Detroit is $14,000, right? They sold the Pontiac Silverdome for $543,000. That's not even the price of a, of a studio in Manhattan. Um, and yet- Less than a lot of houses <laughs> around New York. Yeah, and, w and when Michael and or I went- here. In, pretty much. And when Michael and I went into Detroit, um, you know, we expected to see this Mad Max post-apocalyptic landscape. And to some extent, it is. There's a lot of, of hardship there, and it remains today. But yet, there's some amazing entrepreneurialism. And um, I thought I'd show you these if they come up. But basically, there's tremendous innovation that's happening there. And it began with a, um, if I can flip over. Oh, maybe I'm still on the other slides. We'll see if we can get those in a second. But we met a, f a couple of really interesting people. We met um, Toria Blanchard. Toria is a, um, a founder of a crepery. It's called Good Girls Go to Paris. And um, she, she named her crepery uh, after a scolding that she got from her mother. Um, her mother uh, told her when she was a, a bit of a handful as a, as a teen, her mother told her that, um, that uh, you better be good if you're going to go to uh, to Paris. She ended up going to Paris as a Francophile. She came back and she started her own, her own crepery. And uh, Tori is amazing because she basically started this business using a, um, I'll come back to that in a second. This is Tori. She started her business uh, with a small business loan from a woman named Sue Mosley who runs a private foundation to help entrepreneurs. Sue is known as the unofficial mayor of inner city Detroit. As people were leaving Detroit in droves, entrepreneurs went back in. And Sue basically makes this argument that because there's such a lack of infrastructure in Detroit, there's no one to get in your way. And so entrepreneurialism can flourish. So this grassroots movement started by Toria. She, she began this business, and she turned around then, and she sponsored and helped a competitor two blocks away. This is Charles Sorrell. He started a business um, called Le Petit Zinc. Art, it's a brasserie in Detroit, and it's one of the best French restaurants I've ever been to in my life. And it's in a very, very challenged neighborhood. But what these guys did is they created a 14-point program for people that were going to live in Detroit. They called it the Detroit Declaration. They said that they would only employ people that lived in the inner city in their businesses. They would do their best to source their local foods from people like this guy. This is Patrick Crouch. He's one of 50 urban farmers in Detroit. Do people drive into the restaurant, or are there customers from the, the area around it? How do they, you know, what's their base? They're, they're both. It's very interesting. So you have um, people in the inner city that are really supporting these businesses. And keep in mind, you've still got great big businesses downtown, such as General Motors. But this whole sort of resurrection and inspiration that people from the suburbs are coming in to support these businesses is just starting to go. But I just thought it was interesting to see that, you know, in this landscape where, you know, speculation has burst, there's just an asset. You know, it's a simple asset you can see and you can build from there. Give us a couple more examples. Sure. The we interviewed Paul Savage for the book, and Paul is the CEO of Next Tech Energy Systems. And he had this poster behind his desk as we went into this warehouse in inner city Detroit, and it says, Edison was right. His business is about uh, bringing back direct current right. energy. You know, the AC won out over DC, but it's far less efficient. And so he goes on to talk to us about the fact that he's creating organic energy that's made in Detroit. You have this thing about ceiling tiles with light bulbs built into them? That... Exactly. It's not only safer for electricians, it's much more efficient. And so it's all done off the grid where you create these energy systems inside the uh, the ceiling tiles, and so they've created some very big contracts with some companies, um, and they're starting to build out. I've been at one of these sessions before, and I know the audience who will be asking questions is um, as skeptical as you would expect business people to be. <clears throat> so, one, you know, one thing I was wondering is, are you kind of cherry picking examples mm -hmm. with, with like this? You know, are these are these outliers, or is this really? Uh, a trend that can be um, 
kind of relied upon to say there's a, there's a prevailing shift coming. Companies I'm showing are examples of these very pressing companies that are understanding this trend where I believe people are looking for value and values. And so there's this sense of inspiration that's guiding a lot of these firms. But we also talked to very, very big companies. And we spent time uh, in Redmond with Microsoft and their Elevate America program. A very interesting program where you know, Microsoft um, has vowed to retrain two million Americans with IT skills that had been made you know, sort of redundant during the recession. And I think it's a very interesting example of a large company realizing that it may not sell something immediately, but by making that statement, there's, there's an ability to, to create a future sale. You say something really fascinating about Microsoft, which is that whatever we may think of the devices that Apple is producing, when it comes to brand reputation, Microsoft is actually outpacing them. Yes, if you look outside the, the Technorati and you look to sort of Main Street, Microsoft is a more trusted brand than Apple in our data in Brand Asset Valuator hmm. and has stronger degrees of, of usage. Um, it's also interesting to note, you know, we spent time with um, John Andrews. He's the head of social media at Walmart in Bentonville. And Walmart also has shifted in our data. They've started to connect um, to people. And one of the programs that John talked about was the 11 Moms program, which is a, um, a network of 11 mommy bloggers. So if you go and search the term mommy bloggers, you'll find millions of hits. They're very powerful. They created this 11 Moms network to be an outside advisory board. The reason their reputations are doing better, it's not because Walmart is being better at being Walmart and delivering you know, lower prices or that Microsoft's new operating system is working better. It's because people see the Gates Foundation or they see um, you know, these other efforts that Walmart is doing with environmentalism and they're actually making the connection. Absolutely. I think and that's a function of, of all the channels we have today to evaluate a company. A company and a brand are, are one and the same. And so when we see the, the impact of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, that has impressions on, our, on ourselves as consumers when we think about Microsoft. And yet, <laughs> we're, running a, you know, we're running an article by John in the um, spring issue of strategy and business, the one that's in the works now. And we have another article in the same issue by another writer named Tim Devinney, a professor from Australia. And he says that when you interview people in depth, you know, they'll, they'll pay lip service to environmental practice or to, you know, mm -hmm. companies fair trade or what they do with child mm -hmm. labor. But in the end, at the end of the day, you know, they want the color running shoe that they want and they mm -hmm. don't care, you know, how old the kids are that made it in Southeast Asia or whatever. Right. And it's an excellent question, and I think it comes down to enlightened self-interest. People are looking for value and values, as I said. They are actually demanding that companies be more accountable to what they want, but they also want lower prices, and they also want you know, organic foods, they, but they don't want to be able to have to pay for these things. And I might answer it with a question. I'll uh, come back to Leslie, but I wanted to show you somebody that might help me answer that more clearly for you. Um, this is John Norton. He is a city manager in Everett, Massachusetts. He complained so much about the sorry state of recycling in Everett that he basically was handed the job by the city council. <laughs> the challenge he had was a 5% recycling rate in Everett. He turned to a Brooklyn-based startup company called RecycleBank. What RecycleBank does is they put little RFID chips hmm. onto each recycling bin so that when you take your recycling outside and you put it down on the curb, it weighs it and it kicks that information into your account. So you get what amounts to be being recycling points, frequent flyer miles for recycling. So suddenly you have an idea that's green and green, right? So I'm doing the right thing and I'm being rewarded for it. Now what's interesting about this business in John's case is that he raised his recycling rates by 22% in the first year and lowered his costs by 15%. Now what RecycleBank does is they connect this really great green customer to a lot of big businesses that would like to give away coupons for lattes at Starbucks or discounts at Target to be able to connect to this, this consumer. And I think that's the trend that we're seeing is that we want to find ways to do the right thing, but we also want to find ways to be incentivized for doing it. So there's going to be, a, there's going to be some businesses that really walk an extra mile not knowing what's going to be the payoff, but sooner or later there's going to be more payoff than maybe they expected. And 
with Microsoft and Walmart and City of Everett being early examples? Yeah, I, I think so. I think we're just entering an era of experimentation and investment. This shift from consumption into investment, whether it's the people taking you know a big, big leap on the success of Detroit, and I would not short the Motor City, having spent time there, I was very inspired, mm -hmm. to, to these companies that are realizing that maybe I'm making an investment longer term. And that kind of, I think, raises another point. One of the biggest shifts that we saw in our data in Brand Asset Evaluator was there was this shift toward what do you look for in a company and a brand? And what they said is kindness and empathy. Kindness and empathy went up 391%. It was the single biggest shift of any attribute we'd seen in our brand data going back to 1993. And I think that really means it's marketing as gestures, as true tangible things. What's an example of an empathetic brand? Hyundai. Hyundai's buyer reassurance program, right? It was a, it was a tactic during the crisis, and it helped Hyundai grow 12% in a dismal auto market. So it, what was that? What did they it do? It said if you um, lose your job, you can return the car. You know? Okay. But, but those are the types of things, and there's so many of them. You know, there's, I guess, Bank of America's Keep the Change. You know, um, we interviewed Scott Monty from Ford, who launched the Ford Fiesta by giving people, loaning people the car, and uh, allowing them to give feedback back to Ford, but all through Twitter in an open-ended way. It, great examples of the fact that we're going to be open and transparent and we're going to make a commitment to you. I think that's what this is about. The transparency level today is remarkable. We also interviewed Patagonia for the book. They have a website called the Footprint Chronicles that allows you to go and click on to their website and you can follow the path to purchase of any garment that they make, looking at its carbon footprint um, to its social policies. So we're, we're getting into sort of the the impact that's going to hit big companies. And before we really go there, you know, take us back to some of the other slides you have around uh, sort of, and I know you spent time in Dallas and in some of the other cities. And Love what to. are some of the other places where people are really changing the way they think? Well, this is an interesting example of a, of a local response to a, to a problem. Um, this is in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And this is Tom Levin. He's the owner of Tom's Toys. He's one of 50 merchants who, along with the Chamber of Commerce and the good people of Great Barrington, decided to do something radical, which was create their own currency. They created their own currency called Berkshires, which is named after the Berkshire Mountains. And they did it as a contract between the locals to support the local merchants. Now, there was an incentive, again, green and green. There was an incentive for people to do so because the Berkshires were priced at 95 cents to the dollar. They turned around and, and created their own currency. They issued the bills with faces of famous um, people from the Massachusetts area. Um, and what they ended up doing was creating a, a contract or a covenant that kept these local merchants in business. Because what they didn't understand is when the crisis hit, none of these local merchants could have access to um, credit. So the currencies in the Berkshires basically kept these local merchants in business as the crisis reigned. And this goes back, I mean, the Berkshires go back something like 30 years, don't they? It's just now that they're really replacing cash for... Exactly. Cash. What they did is they, they took this to a new level when the threat became apparent that all these big national chains were coming into their small local towns. Mm -hmm. But what's so interesting is we interviewed a number of the merchants and the people that were using this is that this is symbolic. It's a statement you make. If you're trading currency with Berkshires, you are a local and you are committed to your community. And they know you. And they know you. And that's back again to the spend shift art. The, the idea that this voting with your values and spending isn't necessarily a Republican thing or a Democratic thing. It's about the values that you hold uh, at a, prim primarily at a local level. And it's also it's not a mass thing, is it? I mean, there's a, if you're going to, so there's, it makes a lot of sense if you're running a business, even a manufacturing business, in the Berkshires, mm -hmm. which for those who don't know the Berkshires, is a pretty self-contained part of the world. Um, I mean, a lot of people come in there, a lot of people leave there, but the people who stay there really stay there. And um, one can develop a real relationship with them. But if you're Walmart, or your, you know, Ford, or your, um, 
Ikea or mm -hmm. your Tata, mm -hmm. you know, th then you're on a whole other scale and trust and credibility and help and empathy are a completely different proposition, aren't they? I think they are and that's why there is a huge opportunity for businesses to connect on values because this is a time right now, we, we saw trust in institutions decline by 50% in our data. Financial institutions, the trust was down 58%. As and bad as government. Yeah, well, that, but that's again part of this Berkshires. You start to put this together between Detroit and Berkshires. There's this frustration that nothing is gonna happen no matter what ide ideology you believe in, so you're gonna solve these things for yourself. But in the case of Walmart, they're getting local. I mean, they're figuring out ways to source local produce as a way to sort of create local traction with their communities as well. And yet there's going to be people who look at this trend mm -hmm. and then look at the, you know, the widening gap between executive salaries and other salaries or other forms of what's seen as you know, disproportionate yeah. privilege going to uh, some groups and they're going to say this circle just can't be squared. Well, I think, and that's the thing that people are, are frustrated with, is that they're going back to sort of common sense Main Street solutions to a lot, of their, a lot of their problems because they realize it's impossible to sort of control and solve everything. I'd also say on the, on the crisis, it was interesting to note, um, there was this tremendous sense of just people's psyches being rocked so profoundly by it. I could talk for a minute about um, dentists, yeah, dentists, guns, vasectomies, and shark attacks, okay? So dentists reported um, three out of 10 visits during the crisis related to broken molars. Does anybody know why? Grinding their teeth. FBI reported an increase in background checks by 48% uh, for people for guns during the crisis. Um, vasectomies were up 51% according to the Cornell School of Male Reproductive Health. Um, How about the reversals now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. At shark attacks, though, however, fortunately, were at their lowest level in three years. Does anyone know why? No one's going to the beach, exactly. Timeshares are down, too. <laughs> but, but, but our point was is that there was this ability to kind of reset our expectations and to think in new ways. Everything was so profound. I mean, 80% of people were born after World War II, so in a sense, from a contextual standpoint, this was our Great Depression. Now, it wasn't to the pain, perhaps, of, 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 of our parents and grandparents, but so far. Ev everything, yeah, so far, and everything is relative. Your book frustrated me a little bit in that regard, and because it's easy to read your book and sort of say, well, we were hugely materialistic. We were like a McMansion, um, mm -hmm. Hummer-driven society, and you talk about how GM stopped mm -hmm. producing the Hummer. And then now, suddenly, we are, you know, virtuous and... Uh, and small scale and uh, humble and noble and, and, and you know, as, as somebody who was raising children in a very expensive part of the country, mm -hmm. not Los Angeles, but New York, and there are still other places like that, I, my perception of me and the people I knew wasn't that we were tremendously materialistic. It was just that life was, life demanded a lot. And, and it's Hard to imagine that that's changed all that much. If you go back and you look at um, historical savings rates in America, we saved on average 10% of our income right up until about 1985. At that point, the statistics show us that it took us only about 25 to 30 years to get to a negative savings rate in our country. Mm. And I am partially uh, attribute that to the fact that we were practicing what I call wimpy-nomics in American households. If you remember Wimpy, the character from Popeye, he would gladly repay you on Tuesday for a hamburger today. And that's basically how people live their lives because there was this belief that our housing values are only going to go up. So right up until the crisis, we were generating 10% of our income through basically using our house as an ATM. And when that evaporated and the housing values have, have declined and flattened, persistent unemployment that now exists, and I'm talking about not just employment but underemployment that factors in everything from furloughs to deferred wages and the other things that have hit Americans, coupled with the fact that you go into certain parts of the country, and we did, we visited Dallas and Tampa and Las Vegas, some places that are really, really hard hit. This has adjusted people's realities to, to a, new, a new level, and I think it's created a new set of expectations. I don't think we're being pious, but I think we're being much more discerning with the way that we spend. We're finding that things that we thought were needs turned out actually to have been wants all along. 
I think. I think so, and we're creating brands out of those. Um, so, for example? Well, Art, there's an interesting um, person we met. Her name is Maura McCarthy, and she's the founder of Blue Homes. Blue Homes is an interesting study. They're a prefabbed housing manufacturer that grew 400% last year in the midst of the downturn. What's interesting about Blue Homes is this is spec and design your own home online at bluehomes.com. So people are going online and they're basically building their house uh, online. Blue Homes, which is based in, in uh, Waltham, Massachusetts, in this 200-year-old um, schoolhouse, they have a factory out back. They then build the house for you and they transport it. What's interesting is that the houses are all designed on a unique hinge design. So they all fold up flat like an origami and can be shipped efficiently by rail or by freight. All you need is a hookup and a little bit of land and you're ready to go and they'll get the house up between three and five days. Now, that sounds kind of, kind of crazy and there's this sort of stigma against prefabbed houses, but what's remarkable is they've been featured in Dwell Magazine and in Wallpaper and their two biggest audiences are millennials and seniors which by coincidence share the most values in our data in terms of how they're thinking about life today after the crisis. But again, what, what um, Maura talked to us about is that if you buy a blue home, you can, you're buying the badge of awesomeness, as she says. And the badge of awesomeness reflects a shifting American dream from having stuff to having flexibility. And so consumerism intersected with that. As we got out over our skis, you know, we lost control, we lost freedom. And so she really has an aspect of sort of a Harley Davidson freedom attached to these houses. There's a badge value. And what she said to me, Art, was um, it's an anti-McMansion, to use your oh. words. And the reason it's an anti-McMansion is the homes are also modular. So if you get a raise, add a room. Have a kid, add a room. So it starts to become a badge, not unlike Tom's Shoes and other types of, of firms like that and brands like that that are suggesting a new reality of how we think about our brands and it's our images. It's kind of like the apartments in Peru where you have rebar built into the roof and you can just add another level when you... Uh, exactly. We're going to open this up in just a minute uh, to, the, to the audience, but before we do one last question, which is, or one intermediate question, which is um, say a little bit more about Generation C, you say this, or Millennial Generation, you, you say this is a, a shift in attitudes and, you know, I can remember mm -hmm. In the 60s and in the 80s, we had movements of voluntary simplicity, but and then people got older and mm -hmm. started spending money again. And you're saying this one's this time it's different. If you follow cohort theory, you know Strauss and Howe have, have written a lot on that. I'm a big believer in in their research that the values that um, you form as sort of an adolescent is is related in great context to what's happening around you at that time, and you carry forward those values. My um, my grandmother used to take. Um, lemon peels out of Red Lobster and roll them up in her, um, in her napkin to have for her tea the next day. And I used to think as a, as a high school kid that that was just crazy. <laughs> and yet what we're seeing with millennials is this desire to kind of recapture these old fashioned virtues, these things like community and self-reliance. But it's not just going backwards, it's they're using these amazing new technologies. Um, you know, one of the guys that we interviewed for the book was Groupon you know, Andrew Mason. And Andrew is just spurned Google's offer last week for $6 billion. You know, this is a simple business model, all powered by social media. This business couldn't have existed sort of 10 years ago. But what's interesting about this is we also interviewed millennials in Tampa that were rewarding a business that was being green um, by forming a carrot mob. So carrot mob is an incentive, right? If a carrot is, is an incentive versus a boycott is a stick, what they're doing is they're pooling their spending to come together to force a business very gently to say, if you do the right thing, we'll reward you with our block of buying power, where, where, whether you're a local merchant. I just suggest, Art, that you put together Andrew's business model and the idea of a carrot mob, or even Andrew's first business, which is called thepoint.com, that was based in Chicago to basically crowdsource around helping people with getting money for surgeries or for helping a, a distressed neighbor, you have the potential for a millennial-driven advocacy group that could be um, remarkable and could reshape the relationships we have with business. And be a business model into itself, oddly enough. Um, questions? 
people interested in comments? Certainly a lot to make sense of here. I happen to have Twitter, and I usually like to tweet while someone's speaking, and this uh, came through from USA Today. It's that companies have people, not brands. People come with a brand, and part of their brand is their values and, and what, who they are as people as well as what they do in their profession. So what do they mean by that? Well, perhaps what they mean is um, increasingly when we're dealing with um, institutions, we want to deal with individuals. And um, that there's tremendous opportunity to, to use the people in our companies as, as capital because that's real and that's authentic. And I mean, I'll give you an example. We, we spent time in Las Vegas with Tony Shea, um, the CEO of Zappos, and he has a fabulous book out now called Delivering Happiness. And he basically realizes that his people are an amazing form of asset. And if you have a culture-driven organization that celebrates the mission that they're after, which is great customer service, well, you better walk the talk. And so we spent time with him, and we actually then spent a really interesting afternoon in the customer call center at Zappos. Um, with um, a range of different people that felt completely empowered to embody the values of, of Zappos. Therefore, These are the people in the floor on the call. On the floor, call. right. And if you think about customer call service in most companies, that's outsourced somewhere. They put that into their business and they basically treat these people like Navy SEALs. Which is tremendous reason, esteem. That's one reason they moved to Las Vegas, wasn't it? So they could afford to do that. Exactly. He, he, he wanted to be there for the efficiencies, but he wanted to make a strong statement. If we're gonna be a customer service organization, well, our customer service better be right inside our, our brand. But uh, we spent time with a woman named Crystal Bone who was um, gently counseling um, a man on the phone who wanted to inquire that he wanted to buy women's uh, tree torns. And he was an elderly gentleman and they didn't sell tree torns in, in uh, in the male version anymore, but they felt more comfortable for his feet. And she completely, almost like a psychologist, walked through why that was a perfectly acceptable choice. But that's the kind of things that I think that Tony is doing. Be hard more to outsource. Yeah, well more companies need to do that. I think that's maybe what, the, what that article is about, is that your people matter so much in the organizations today. I'm almost afraid to ask this. <laughs> Um, what does all this say for the public perception of public sector uh, services and the future directions those might need to take? Well, I think, as the John Norton example suggests, there can be effective public-private collaborations, such as between his recycling uh, program and Recycle Bank. But more and more, these things need to happen at a, at a grassroots level. I think that's the larger frustration is that we've lumped in big business with, with big government and whether you're a progressive or a, a liberal or somewhere in between, you're frustrated by the fact that nothing gets done. Yeah. I don't know, if Art, if you'd add anything to that. People on the left look at big business and say, those are not my people, they're not making decisions on my behalf. People on the right look at big government and say, there's not my people, they're not making decisions <laughs> on my behalf. Yeah. In both cases, the the group they see is not exactly the group that's making them angry, and they, they're kind of both symbolic. Exactly. And there's a lot to be angry about, but it's not necessarily related in a one-to-one -one way to those same institutions. Absolutely. I just wondered, you seem to represent Walmart as the good guys, <clears throat> when um, in fact, uh, uh, what I read online, I just wondered if you could tell me the truth, mm -hmm. is that at the moment 1.6 million women are involved in a class action lawsuit for gender discrimination. Uh, absolutely, and um, first of all, I'm just a researcher, so um, what I'm seeing are shifts in, in perceptions. I think the first thing is that brand equity in companies is in continuous flux, and with the case of Walmart, we've seen significant shifts for them being more green through some of their programs like the labeling and the, and the food sourcing. Not to suggest they don't significantly still have issues, but I think that's the lesson for, the, for companies is how are you finding ways to invest like Microsoft did or, or like Walmart did with its 11 mom program to try to find ways to build up your brand equity because you're gonna face these, these issues. You know, there is a legitimate question though not that your question wasn't legitimate, but there's a, there's a, there's a <laughs> ramification of it that, that... He does that uh, to me all the time. Um, 
well, it's, it's me doing that to me, actually, in this <laughs> case. The, um, can a company the size of a Walmart or a Microsoft or you know even a Tata or a, or an Apple you know can they really walk the the walk in in that way because they've got so many obligations and you know shareholder responsibility in the case of Walmart they've got histories you know involving downtown groups and labor groups and gender related issues going back you know decades what are you know now you come along mm -hmm. and say to them you know well, your reputation's on the line, and guess what? Your business is on the line with your reputation in a whole new way. Mm -hmm. um, how are they going to reconcile that? I think we're entering in an era of CSR 2.0. You know, I think corporate social responsibility 1.0 was always followed by the word initiative. You ever notice that? Which is sort of code for someone to make us look good. And um, <laughs> Job it out to the department. Pretty much. Outsource it. And now what I think you've seen is that you know, CEOs of companies are realizing that they are brands, that the company is the brand itself. And so it's starting, like Patagonia, to become a conversation, not just a series of, of things that we put out there in advertising. It's about tracking our progress and discussing about what we're doing. Keep in mind, too, that it's hugely important for retaining and attracting talent, for supply chain you know, relationships, all those. I think it's it's a new era that we're entering in, and it's just beginning, but it's realizing that, you know, the, the CEO and the people inside the company driving values in their business model and their culture is important. I'll give you an example. Um, does anybody watch Undercover Boss, right? So Undercover Boss, it was just interesting to note last year that I think five of the six companies that were featured in Undercover Boss, their stock went up uh, the week after really? the shows were on. I'm not saying it's a trading strategy, but, um, <laughs> but I think you know, John Borthwick from Betaworks told us, um, as we interviewed, we were talking about one of their programs that's about transparency. He said that people want to see your struggles. And I asked him what he meant by that. He said, even if you're right or wrong, or people don't disagree with you or not, they want to know how you make decisions. And if you think of that like waste management CEO, where he you know, really struggled over the decisions that he was making, that's a new era of transparency. It's like the political candidates who get mileage out of redemption. Yeah. Either there's wisdom in the crowds and they're perceiving these companies correctly, or else somebody's got some really good PR staffs. Right, and right, exactly. But I, I also think that opening ourselves up as leaders to having these conversations is, is a really interesting dynamic. And I think we're going to start to see, as, um, you know, as BP has learned, that what is the true definition of a public company? public company isn't just about being accountable to shareholders, it's about being accountable to us. Other questions, comments? You're speaking about this trend towards transparency, and I find that really fascinating as subject matter. Do you, did you discover any examples of public sector company or you know public sector areas or governments specifically that are trending towards transparency that I feel like it's so secretive and so hard to get at information. Do you, did you discover any uh, useful tools out there to help us get at that information? Certainly. I mean, from the public sector standpoint, we, we did focus most of the, the book on small businesses all the way up to large businesses, and that's in and of itself a really excellent question and topic to explore further. But there's all kinds of really interesting tools right now that people have. Um, give me an example. There's a a company called Square Trade. Square Trade basically publishes um, the warranties of all manufacturers out on the internet for everyone to see and to make comparison. That's just a perfect example of all of this perfect information that we have out there. So, you know, your marketing, your words have got to be followed by your intentions because it's the tangible things behind them that we can figure out in a moment. There's also the new, you may be thinking of this, the open government initiative in the federal side. And I don't know too many of the details, but a lot of it has to do with creating protocols that open up the data so that businesses can resell it or reuse it in ways that perhaps the original agencies wouldn't have thought of. And there's also an interesting new set of technologies on the consumer side, such as Swipely. Um, Swipely is a, um, a method for you to um, share and post your information about the things that you've bought and purchased. And it sounds really strange uh, on the surface of this, like why would I want to tweet that I bought a sweater? But 
the fact is, is that inside your social network, someone might be able to tell you that you could have gotten a better deal on that someplace else. Or maybe a manufacturer might come in and say, wow, I just noticed you bought this sweater. Do you want a discount on the next one? And then there's WikiLeaks. <laughs> uh, another uh, qu question, and then woman in black, and then the woman in red. Did your research cover at all nonprofits or charitable giving? We, we didn't. We did not get um, deep into either, either of those areas, and with great regret as I, as I came back to, to write the book. Malcolm Gladwell, rather infamously now last month, um, had, a, had a, an article in the New Yorker in which he sort of threw cold water on the ability of social media to really affect large change. I don't know if you had any reaction to that. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, he's always writing amazing, uh, interesting things. Um, I don't necessarily ag agree with that because I think it's all still being developed and tested and vetted. Like I, like I said earlier about carrot mobs and, and Groupon, I'm very fascinated by the fact that we as people have tremendous scaling effects. Now we've seen WikiLeaks for, <laughs> For bad, but like, what? What if these things are social around good? You know, what would happen if if a group of people came together and created these massive buying blocks where we could organize ourselves and go to any manufacturer and say, uh, or any brand or company and say, these are the terms upon which we'll we'll work. So, and we'll favor the company that meets our terms. Exactly. And you know, it's more than just an interest group like the Forest Products Council. It's a broad-based right. And then could morality. Yeah, and then couldn't it art be about thinking about businesses as being p political candidates to constituencies? And, and where does you, that go? And then you have competing constituencies, and suddenly our business world becomes uh, kind of like the political world. It's a, mm. It is a new world, anyway. You've talked a lot about small businesses. I'm just wondering if you've seen any uh, spend shift in real estate. In real estate, well, we, we definitely talked about um, Detroit. Talking about the banks, I'm talking about people and if there's been a shift in how they're looking at the purchase or sale of where they're going to live personally. Certainly, I mean, not specifically in the, in the book, but more broadly, the things that I've tracked and, and seen is a, is a greater degree on, for the first time ever, the square footage in the American home dropped. You, you might know last year as we started to question like I talked about with Maura McCarthy, how much house do I need? How much space do I need? You I also you saw that. you saw a movement towards renters, a shift in renting over homeowning. Um, difficult to understand how much of that has been driven by hardship versus by actual desire. But um, there's a whole chapter in, in spend shift around living what we call the liquid life, which is um, finding new ways to sort of generate um, value out of the products you already have and living a more nimble adaptable uh, way of living. I wanted to ask you about the flip side. Um, any examples come to mind of a company that's sort of been caught being uh, not authentic and, and where this really was PR and the strategy backfired? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's always those e examples out there. I think it was um, quite obviously quite difficult. I think Smart Brief labeled uh, Tony Hayward the worst CEO of the year. Um, that was notable, but I think that was just interesting to say when I went through and started to watch as that was unfolding, you know, they had ads on TV talking about what they were doing, and yet there was this guy who was kind of like this Red Adair guy. I don't know if you remember this guy, Art. Oh, yeah. But, he, you know, he was talking about, hey, guys, this is really complicated, and we're doing this, we're tracking it, but I would have put a real-time camera on that guy, and that's what I would have been focusing on for those 90 days that BP was struggling, because I think that's what we're looking for, is that sort of access. The theme here is that there's a discipline to walking the talk that is often overlooked, and it's not a PR discipline. It's a discipline that encompasses everything from operations to marketing to the way you present yourself as a company and then to these fine-grained relationships. And I think it's fair to say that very, very few senior executives of large companies have yet internalized that discipline the same way that they've internalized the discipline of getting the right numbers out in the quarterly earnings reports. And how important that discipline turns out to be, I don't know, is, that's an open question, isn't it? I think absolutely. I think that there's a broader degree of, of how we're going to interact and who are our constituencies. Is it now just um, 
shareholders or is it all these other groups? I mean, one of the themes I saw in a lot of the business models was this idea of a hat trick business model that was working for a lot of the startups where you needed to benefit your company, obviously, by creating a profit, but you needed to also have strong degrees of creating value for the community as well as for your, for your customers. Um, I just wanted to touch on Leslie Halleck real quick before we, we finish. <coughs> Leslie is part of a, a real big consumer trend that I think that goes to the heart of this crisis, which is the shift from consumption to production. That across many of American uh, households, we're finding ways to eliminate um, overhead costs by doing things ourselves and in insourcing. And in Leslie's case, she is a backyard chicken raiser in Dallas, Texas. She's in this upscale neighborhood in, in Dallas, and she um, basically is holding one of her seven chickens. That's Phyllis, named after Phyllis Diller. As we talk about in the book, Phyllis got away, and the neighbors called the, the police. The police discovered that there were 12 neighbors in Leslie's upscale neighborhood in, in North Dallas that were raising chickens. And um, she went one step further. Once the, it was discovered that there was no ordinance against backyard chicken raising, city council hastily passed one. They said no roosters, but you could have chickens. But she turned around then and she saw an opportunity and she put an ad on Craigslist and she said, come and learn how to raise chickens. And um, the very first morning at 10 a.m., she had 100 cars pull up in front of her house. <laughs> but the larger story in this is that, you know, 23 million Americans grew their own food last year. You know, there was the rise in home canning. This was about this shift from consumption to production. And at the core of it is what did we lose during the crisis? Yes, we lost wealth, but we lost control. And I think that's what people are looking for is a sense of control. So mindfulness, in a way, you may not choose to be mindful about how you take care of your house or grow your food or whatever, but that turns out to be rewarding in a way that for a lot of people is unexpected. Absolutely. And uh, very lasting. We have time for one more question. And there it I don't know if you addressed it earlier because I was a little late, but did you talk about the DIY movement? I did. I'll talk about it briefly. These are two people we interviewed for the book. This is Phil Tyrone. He's the online editor for Make Magazine, which is part of this do-it-yourself hacker culture. They have another company called Adafruit Industries. What they do is they sell these electronic um, software kits that they are basically the foundation of building all kinds of things. So you can build your own clock radios, build your own blenders. And the interesting thing about this is, is that they create these video online maker forums where thousands of people will get online. And as Phil told us, one of the things he found was that um, there were these young millennial tech enthusiasts being mentored online through these retired engineers from Goddard and NASA. So one argument we had through social, um, through social media in these forums is that are we starting to see generational divides disappear as people are coming around sort of shared interests? So John, um, let me ask the question that always comes to mind when people are talking about big broad trends composed of a lot of data points. <clears throat> and. Um, Clearly, any trend, you're sort of making sense of it because something affected you. So um, what, of all the, you know, you and Michael went around the country. Of all the people you talked to, all the things you saw, um, what sort of surprised you the most or made you click and say, this is not a group of isolated stories. This is really something happening here. What was that? Was there a moment or was it, how did that happen? The time we spent in Detroit. Um, only because when I saw the hardship there and yet the resiliency of the American spirit manifested in very different ways, you know, entrepreneurialism, innovation, optimism, it started to set a tone for us that maybe there was a larger story out here other than the fact that people were being more frugal. And I think that's what this is about. It's about that, you know, we as um, people are adjustable and adaptable, businesses are adaptable and the future is not nearly as dim as it appears. And with that, let me um, invite you to thank John Gerzema. And um, thanks, thanks, very, very illuminating. Thank you.